Canada's Minister of National Defence issued a stark warning about the state of military recruitment. If what you are, have been doing for decades is no longer working for you, you can't just keep doing it. And over the past three years, more people have left than have, have entered. That is, is frankly, it's, 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 it's a death spiral for the Canadian Armed Forces. We cannot afford to continue on that pace. We've got to do something differently. The Prime Minister pointed to his government's investments in the military when asked about the state of the Canadian Armed Forces. Over the past years, every single year, this government has invested more uh, in defence. We're going to continue to make sure that the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces have the tools necessary uh, to step up. So what does this all mean for the state of Canada's military? Retired Lieutenant General Guy Thibault is the chair of the board of the CDA Institute and a former vice chair of uh, chief of the defense staff. He joins me now. General, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Hey, David. Day. Thank you for having me. Uh, we, we got two very alarming uh, comments and revelations, I think, about the state of the military this week. And I want to start with the first one from, from my colleague Murray Brewster. The internal report says only about 58% of Canada's military could be mobilized if there was an urgent need to support NATO. What does that tell us about the state of the armed forces in this country? So I really appreciate uh, Murray's coverage of this as talking about essentially the readiness of the Canadian forces to undertake the missions that the government of Canada has asked of it. And it uh, covers uh, materiel readiness, it uh, covers the people readiness, it covers the overall sustainment ability of our, of our operations. Uh, and so from the perspective of 58% uh, of our material capacity ready, our vehicles, our major fleets, uh, air, sea and land, uh, is actually quite alarming uh, in terms of uh, a demonstration of uh, the underfunding that has uh, chronically been afforded to defence for keeping these systems ready for operations. Is it just underfunding? Because the other uh, alarming thing to my ears was when Defence Minister Bill Blair said that the military is facing a death spiral on recruitment and that there are just more people leaving than there are coming in. Is the lack of interest because of the lack of funding, or is there something larger happening there? Well, I, th I think it's a, great, uh, it's a great question to ask. In the last two days, we've had the, the Ottawa Conference on Defence and Security gathered uh, to really look at the world and look at where the Canadian forces fit in it. And we actually sp spent quite a bit of time talking about the state of the armed forces and its the need to adapt to the changing world around us. The people problem is at the centerpiece of the Canadian Forces readiness. Uh, you can have the best equipment, the best, uh, cap you know, the best capabilities, the best mm -hmm. processes, all the money in the world, but if you don't have people, you don't have capabilities to actually undertake the operations. So the people problem has been, I think, uh, understood for some time. This isn't a new phenomena. I think that uh, uh, COVID really hurt in terms of our ability to get out and uh, really attract uh, members to the to the Canadian forces or attract Canadians to the to members of the Canadian forces, and at the same time, uh, you know, as we've seen, quiet quitting, people looking to uh, to, to to move on. Uh, the demands of Canadian military service are quite demanding on the families. Uh, our families are, are facing the exact same problems that the rest of the Canadians are having with right. respect to inflation, housing. So I think. This issue of attraction, recruiting, and the problem of keeping people with you, when you combine the two of them, it makes for a major problem. So what's the path out of this? I mean, we've seen increasingly international players weighing in on the level of Canadian military spending, right? The U.S. ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to NATO, the secretary general, the, the Latvian defense minister is here saying we would encourage our allies to move towards that 2% NATO spending target. Not only is Canada not doing that, these deficiencies and these recruitment challenges are persisting. How do you move forward here? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, General Eyre, the Chief Defence Staff, has been very clear in terms of reconstitution. You have to start with people. That's the first, uh, first, peep, uh, the first part of the problem space. We actually have to fill out the ranks. We're well below uh, what the government has, uh, has authorized, so uh, 15,000, a combination of regular and reserve forces. So we have to make, uh, make up that delta and you have to deal with the, the shortfall in terms of those who are leaving. So the, the number is fairly, fairly significant. So I think you start with making sure we keep the, uh, uh, the, the focus on recruiting. And I think that the, it's not that they're not doing anything. Like I have to say that I believe that the, the team that's uh, dealing with, uh, with recruiting is trying to be very creative, very innovative, looking for new ways of doing, mm -hmm. doing business. Uh, I think this past year they've actually probably got to a point where they're pretty much going to break even. So the, 
Uh, that doesn't sound too great in terms of uh, traction versus uh, retention, but at least it's uh, stemming the, the flow and I think they're turning the corner. And so I think that's a positive first step. I, I think the, me the, the government is sending mixed messages though, because I think that when we look at the, the, the budgetary constraints that, uh, that the entire federal government is, is, is going through right now has a, uh, a really significant effect on the Canadian forces. Where the capital program isn't a problem, the government continues to fund the future capabilities. So we're seeing the investments in new platforms, but where the squeeze is happening is in the operations, the maintenance uh, funds, and that's where we really talk about training, the infrastructure, and that's the quality of the service life. And so I think if the members of the forces who are serving aren't seeing the investment in the organization in that way, it, it kind of is adding to the, to the problem. Right, you say breaking even on recruitment may not sound like a big thing, but the quickest way out of a hole is to stop digging, right? Which, right. which is also what the government's trying to do financially, which affects defense, right? Because there are these financial pressures in core government, the defense policy review, which we've been promised an update on for quite some time, keeps shifting and moving and shifting and moving. And what, what signal does all of that send to you about well, addressing these issues? Well, to the signal to Canadians about what the government's intention is, to signal to the Canadian forces themselves about the government's intentions to actually continue to invest in them as, a, as an employer of choice and to giving them really the capabilities they need to execute the missions that they're asked to do. Uh, signal to our allies uh, in terms of the burden sharing and I think, you know, the, the alliance and collective security is dependent on all of us working together uh, for the purposes of deterrence and, uh, you know, when members of the alliance aren't necessarily living up to their commitments, it's sending a uh, signal to our adversaries as well. So I think that, you know, the, we would hope that the defense policy update will show those new signals. We know, and I think the government has said uh, that there's more to be done. Hold, you know, I think Minister Blair uh, is in earnest in terms of wanting to work on these problems and make things better. Uh, but, you know, in the short run, it seems like the government has concluded that things are going to get worse before they get better. Right. Well, and, and you know, in, in calmer times, you can kind of put defense spending yes. to the back burner. Um, you know, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, it has not been calm since then. And, and Canada has committed to increase its, its presence in Latvia by 2026 to be leading, a, you know, the, yes. the, the full capacity of the commitment there. But with the mobilization challenges... Uh, with the recruitment challenges, with the financial challenges, do you think Canada can meet its commitment to even the Latvian part of the NATO operation, let alone the larger 2%? We, listen, I think uh, in operations we have nothing really to worry about the quality of the members we put in, the sure. equipment we're putting in, uh, that we're going to we'll fulfill our, fully our, our, our mission to, to Latvia. There, there's some urgent operational capabilities that we need to kind of really enable that mission, and I know that the government... Uh, is, uh, is moving forward on those. But the, the broader picture, I think, is to say, hey, look, uh, look at Canada's north and look at the Arctic and look at uh, an area where, you know, previously we haven't been too, too worried about it because it wasn't accessible with climate change. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, this is uh, now going to be increasingly an area of, of strategic interest for Canada. And, uh, you know, if we just tally up our interests all over the world in uh, Asia Pacific with the Indo-Pacific strategy, if we look at NORAD modernization, the approaches to, uh, uh, to the continent are working with the United States, look at additional kinds of threats, cyber or space, you know, I think you can't help but conclude that uh, Canada needs to invest more in its fundamental insurance for securing the country. Just as a final point, uh, the Arctic keeps coming up when we talk to people about what Canada can do. I know this is something the Americans would really like Canada to take a lead on, to sort of maybe take that off their plate a little bit, you know, and, and show a commitment to continental defense, yes. if not able to meet the full 2% of NATO. Do you think that should be the focus here like for Canada's own national sovereignty and national security? But... I don't want to say appease the allies, but to demonstrate to, to your allies, in particular the Americans, that you are serious about at least looking after your own backyard. I think that it's an essential, uh, it's an essential feature to what we would hope the government will are, you know, articulate in the defense policy update is kind of a prioritization of where we're going to focus. We can't be everywhere and try to be everything to everyone. I think we need to make mm -hmm. some fundamental choices. We talked a lot about the Arctic over the last couple of days. Seven of the eight Arctic nations are now members of NATO. Uh, we had the Secretary General in Canada's far north uh, last year, and I think it's, uh, it would be, I think, really a, a way for Canada to contribute to collective security by focusing in on our own backyard in a very strong way. Lieutenant General Guy Thibault, thank you for your time today. David, you're welcome.